Hello, this is John Jughead Pearson here in Osaka, Japan at about 1 a.m. Um, I am engaging with you, my small but lovely audience, on the second record in the chronology of my record releases and the bands that I've been on. Um, the idea is to... Ooh, it's thundering here in uh, Japan. We don't hear a lot of thunder, actually. It rains quite a bit, but I, I was just saying today about how I never hear much thunder. But I guess tonight is different from usual. Um, yes, I'm attempting to go through all of the records that I've been on, and uh, what I do is I play the record uh, once for myself um, and to refresh myself with the songs, and then I just spontaneously... Uh, try to go through the songs on the record and see what I remember and see what stories I can come up with. Um, I really enjoyed doing the one uh, I actually just last night of the uh, self-titled record by Screeching Weasel. Um, this one I'm a little bit more hesitant. I don't even know if I'll uh, release this night's uh, take on this. We'll see. Um, I don't know. The the Boogada 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 record, which is our my second record I've been on with this is Screeching Weasel, 1988. Um, it says December, recorded in uh, October of 1988. Um, this one is really pretty close to my heart, and uh, it's one of my top favorites, because uh, it has the nice transition of songs that are going from our more hardcore days to the uh, more uh, melodic uh, songs that Ben started writing. Um, and it really appealed to me a lot more. Uh, the band seemed to, to actually, I don't know, more and more it became more important to me. And we started dedicating most of our lives, me and Ben, to uh, keeping the band, uh, the band surviving. Um, so it's, uh, I faced this, face this one with a little bit more trepidation because uh, my memory is bad and I, and, and I don't remember a lot about these songs, but... I want to give this a go because I want to commit to the the idea of going through all of the records. Um, so let's start with a little history. I like to go to the wiki page and then I sort of go through what they have to say about the record and then I'll comment on it. But first I'm going to go through the facts here. Uh, well, no, no, let's, let me start reading. So, boogada, 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 with an exclamation point. Um, which was, a, it says in this, these notes that it was uh, a friend of ours that used to say it to girls out a window uh, and it was the guy who helped come up with the uh, band title. The, the, that man was Matt Carlson. Um, but I don't remember this him saying boogada, boogada, boogada. But it's quite possible because he was uh, quite a funny guy who would, well, he is still a funny guy that would uh, make up a really goofy thing. So it is quite possible that, that that's who it was. And Ben actually took a, quite a liking to him back in those days. Um, so it, it could be possible that that was from Matt Carlson, the same guy who went to Western with my friend Matt Nelson, who uh, wore the shirt uh, Screaming Otter in My Pants. Uh, so Boogada 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 is the second studio album by the Chicago-based punk rock band Screeching Weasel. That is true. The album was originally released on vinyl in December 1988 through Roadkill Records. Oh, I'll have something because I, I might forget this later. But one of the stories I always love telling about this uh, record, um, and the original one is Pink, uh, and that was sort of something we got from Adrenaline OD too. Their album was Pink also. I think it was the Wacky Hijinks record was, oh, not the Wacky Hijinks, or maybe one of the Wacky Hijinks, or Humongous Fungus Among Us. I don't remember which one. One of them was Pink, and they used to also sell pink shirts with their band name on it. And uh, we sort of stepped into that place and sort of uh, also like this idea of a, you know, a hardcore punk band uh, having a pink record. Um, but the, the story I always like to tell is that uh, when we got these records, we went on a tour. Uh, we, we screened all our own shirts ourselves. I made the screen and uh, spent like a couple of days in my in my room with the, sh with the floor all covered with shirts, screening one at a time of the logo of the, uh, of the weasel. Um, and actually, that, that shirt I just saw today, that's the one that Mike Durnt from uh, Green Day used to wear, is one that I actually uh, hand-screened. Um, but we were on the road, and uh, we had uh, all the records. We were touring in a Chevy Malibu. Uh, this is when, when uh, Vermin and, uh, and Vapid were in the band. It was me, Ben, Vermin, and Vapid uh, touring across the country in uh, the Chevy Malibu. We kept all, 
all our clothes and the records in a one of those camper type plastic box things that you could fasten to the top of your car. And uh, when we were driving through the desert, um, all of the records melted. We were stupid, and we we left a, all the book of the book of the book of the records in the uh, in the top thing, and they all melted and were all warped. Uh, most of them we had to dig through, and I think we threw out about three fourths of the records that we had with us on tour. And then by the time we got to Florida, uh, we decided that we were going to give all these records away, and they were sort of prizes for a skate contest. Uh, it was really it was really bizarre uh, because everyone realized you know the records were warped and they were probably in on the joke with us. I can't remember, but uh, I remember playing and all the records were whizzing all around. All the warped records were flying through the air. Um, so that's uh, a big percentage of our of that first pressing went to being uh, whipped around as warped records at a skate contest. Um, so let's read on here. Um, the album was originally released on vinyl. I got that. It was the group's only album to feature Fish on bass and Steve Cheese on drums, both being fired shortly after the album's release. That seems a little harsh. Uh, there's been some pretty harsh firings in the band, but those two are slightly different. Uh, Steve was living in Wisconsin and was getting harder and harder uh, for him to play, and he wasn't really uh, touring. He didn't He didn't do very good with the Berkeley tour when the first time we went to Berkeley. He... Uh, Ended up complaining a lot. You know, Ben was a big smoker, so the car was always smoky, and he hated that, and, and just was sort of uh, uh, passive aggressive about it. Um, so that I mean, he quietly uh, it was kind of mutual for him to leave the band. Uh, same thing was with Warren. We we still uh, stay pretty close with uh, Warren. He just uh, wasn't really into it. I think he was kind of done with punk rock and. He uh, is now a full-time math teacher, so I think he... It, there wasn't really firings really as much with those guys. Um, the, remix, the remix is found on every subsequent release of the album. Yeah, that's right. The, we, did the, we did the first time we recorded it with Phil Bonet, and then we went back when uh, Lookout was going to release it, and we, uh, we remixed it and we added a few uh, elements to it. I might hit, hit upon some of those as we go through the songs. Um, although still influenced by hardcore punk, the album also shows hints of the band's later melodic Ramones-inspired sound. That's, I think I already said that. That's true. Uh, at the time of its release, the album had sold around 5,000 copies. I thought we only printed 2,000. 5,000. Hmm. I don't know if that's true. Uh, which was seen as an accomplishment for a smaller punk rock band. The album was remixed for release in the UK in early 1989. Oh, that's why we remixed it. There we go. So we remixed it for that uh, before Lookout. And the remixed version is used for every subsequent issue. Yep. It was re-released on CD, vinyl, and cassette by Lookout Records on September 25th, 1992. was later remastered and reissued on CD by Asian Man Records in 2005. Recess Records reissued a vinyl version in 2008 and then on CD in 2010. It is the best-selling album of the band's discography. That is very true. Uh, it's probably uh, a lot to do with the fact that it has the big, huge weasel on the cover of it. But I also think it's because a lot of the punk fans still like the, a lot of the hardcore sounding of it uh, mixed with the melodic uh, involved in it. Um, you know, actually, uh, this might be a good point to talk about the, the album cover itself. It was originally supposed to be... Uh, I have a friend named Doug who was uh, an older fellow, and he uh, was an artist, and he created uh, this pink skeleton that had worms uh, crawling out of its mouth, and it was in a black, uh, like a vinyl frame. Uh, and it was really cool looking. I still have it. Um, and uh, Ben really liked that thing too, so we were going to make that the actual cover of the record. Um, so we, we were told that we were supposed to make slides of it, so... I still have those little bit of slides with the uh, with the skeleton on it. So we did that, and then once again, like the first record, maybe a night or two before the we were supposed to uh, send it off to press, uh, they told us that uh, they wouldn't be able to use a photograph for the prices that we were paying or whatever. We couldn't we couldn't do it. So we got our friend, uh, my friend Paul Russell. Uh, ben asked him to do up some weasel cartoony type things, and. Um, it might have been a before. We were probably going to use it for the lyric sheet and stuff like that. 
And uh, I remember the night before, we didn't know what we were going to do. I think we used a lot of my Abbott's things still. And the whole inside lyric sheet has a lot of great photos of the band. Uh, I love that inside thing. Um, and then at the last moment, we decided that we were going to use this photo of the weasel as the cover. Uh, and that's it, it happened really at the last moment. We we need to have it. We needed to have it done. So that's how the uh, big weasel became uh, the front of it. And I, don't, and I think it didn't even say booga da booga da booga on it, if I'm not mistaken. It could have. I'm not sure. I can't remember. I don't have one with me. Maybe it did say it above uh, on the on the top of it. I think uh, Paul also uh, designed the the wordage of how it's how it's spelled. So, but that uh, that that record cover that logo has become quite the tattooed uh, band's uh, logo across the world, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, so now I'm going to get, let's get into the songs. Um, the studio time for this, I kind of get confused with the first one, too, and I, I can't distinguish them much. Um, it was good having uh, Warren in the band. Uh, Warren uh, was a lot more, he was he was just a lot of fun. And he was really goofy, and uh, I don't know if he was a better bass player, but he seemed to understand the groove of the of the band a little better. Um, he was kind of, uh, yeah, his playing was kind of wild and all over the place because he wasn't as used to playing with other musicians, uh, with with uh, experience with, with the Ozfish, was just him and the drummer. Um, but his he was a really good element in the band. I, I think it was it it was a good part of uh, how he changed the band a bit. Um, another thing too is that the, there was, as I was listening to this, I realized that a lot of these songs were recorded earlier. Uh, a couple of them were on an EP that we were doing, a split EP with uh, Warren Fish from, with, with the Ozfish, and uh, that got lost uh, when a plant, um, the plant that was pressing it, kind of burned down and we lost the masters for that. So but we have uh, we had test pressings of it, so that's all that was left of that. So a few songs were from that, and then we re-recorded -re those. Uh, and then a couple other ones, We I think we just went into the studio, I don't know why, uh, just maybe as a demo, and a couple of those were from there, like uh, I Want to Be Naked, and also uh, I think Ashtray. Um, so that was interesting. So as I was going through this, I realized that some of these are like second versions of the, of the songs. So... Uh, I, I bring that up because we used to just, I mean, Ben was writing so quickly and we were doing the band so quickly. Like, I think between the us being a band and the first record coming out and the second record coming out was almost just like a year and a half, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 87 to 88. Um, so I, I got the impression that, you know, we were just pushing them out so quickly, but really on, on Boogada, some of them were a little bit more rehearsed than I would think than they were on the first record. Um, so let's go through these. The first track, um, oh, the original uh, has that uh, all in the family on the beginning of it uh, that talks about her being a dingbat. Uh, and so that was where the term dingbat came from, was from the all in the family TV show, which Ben really liked, loved that show. He used to imitate, uh, used to imitate them all the times, so the arguments they used to have on that show. Um, it also, if I'm not mistaken, I think Ben wrote some of the lyrics based on uh, Vinny's old girlfriend, Anne, who I brought up in the last podcast. Um, that was that was just a lot of fun. We used to open up a lot of our, our live sets with that song, too. It was pretty great. And that was... Um, oh, another thing is that Ben started playing guitar on these a lot more. Um, and he even admits in these notes that he wasn't playing on all the songs, and it's true. I, I still did most of the rhythm uh, sections of it, um, but he was doing at least half, if not more, of the solo type stuff on the record. Um, so Dingbat was one of the ones that he did the solo for, and I played the rhythm tracks on that. Um, and then the second one is Love. Uh, I don't have much to say about that, except that... Um, it was yet another song that he brought in, and I was like, this was changing the direction of the band. Um, and the, the more serious tone and the more melodic element of it was uh, was really strong. And, and I thought those were a good two songs to start the album with. Uh, the third song is Zombie, uh, which was uh, music by me and lyrics by Ben. 
Um, that's still a little bit more of the uh, the older. I feel like the stuff I was writing was more like the first record and the second record, and I was I really even though I was not into all the punk bands as much as Ben was, I had a lot more influences going on. Um, I think I really took to the angry Samoan sort of uh, feel, and uh, that song had a little bit of that sort of uh, very simple chord progressions on it, and then. Um, I, I love this little uh, guitar hooky stuff that I was doing. Um, so that's about that one. Um, this ain't Hawaii. Uh, I, that was a really great song. The one that I said on the other podcast, uh, the other uh, YouTubing, the other night that I said uh, Surfing in Wilmette is the name of the song, but actually is This Ain't Hawaii. Uh, the, the song 7-Eleven sort of reminded me of, uh, or like seemed like a transition song into This Ain't Hawaii. Uh, and that's sort of about, you have to, you know, once again, uh, us being in the suburbs, we were in sort of the more middle class suburbs, but um, all the middle class suburb kids uh, used to go to uh, Lake Michigan, to like Wilmette and Winnetka, and, uh, you know, to go to the beach. And that's where you would run into all the more rich uh, students from Northwestern and all the sort of richer families. So I think that song was sort of a reaction to a lot of them even used to talk like they were like, uh, you know, surfers from San Diego or California. So uh, I think that song was sort of a reaction to uh, those people. Uh, we Skate was a quick song that uh, that I wrote the music for and Ben wrote the lyrics. Um, we weren't really skaters ourselves. I think uh, we kind of made fun of it, but also sort of admired the skaters at the same time. So that was just a really simple, stupid song about uh, skating. Uh, Police Insanity. Uh, I don't remember anything about that song, uh, except the music was by uh, Warren. Uh, yeah, I really liked the stuff he brought in. You know, he was definitely still holding down that sort of hardcore element of the band. Um, but I really liked his playing. And that's that's some fast stuff. And I, you know, one of the things that uh, Ben used to talk about and we used to talk about is that the the band at the beginning was about trying to play past our expectations or past our abilities. Um, and this album really sort of shows that. I, I can really feel myself trying to keep on the rhythm of a lot of these songs. I just wasn't a really fast guitar player. So um, I think that it really gives it sort of a nice element of me trying to constantly trying to catch up with myself. Um, and, you know... Steve wasn't the best drummer, so uh, I was also competing with trying to keep the rhythm, but then him losing the rhythm. So it really seems to be a, a, a sort of a tense feeling that I, I really think actually helps this record. Um, then Stupid Over You, which is Ben's song about being in love with Madonna, because um, he had a big, huge fascination with uh, Madonna. Uh, and that one... The solo at the beginning of that was me. It was written by Ben, but uh, I was playing it because I think, the once again, it was quicker than we expected it. And then, but I couldn't get the second part. The really the second part of the solo is really messy because I think it was too quick. And it, I still think it sounds cool. And we doubled it to get to make it sound more. Uh, I don't know more more full, but it's 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 still there's too many notes in a small amount of time. So it was supposed to be one of those more melodic solos like Hey Suburbia, but it came out being a little bit more, I don't know, quick, like instead of do-do-do-do-do, you know, that in that sort of way. Um, also, I think Stupid Over You might have references to the uh, the movie with Jerry Lewis. Uh, let me, I might come back to that. I can't think of that. Oh, King of Comedy. Yes, King of Comedy. Uh, so, because Ben was a big fan of that movie, King of Comedy. Uh, then we got Runaway, which is a cover of the Del Shannon uh, song. I, I think that's just one we used to do a lot at shows back in the, really in the beginning. And uh, it was one of the few that I uh, was confident in, in, in yelling the backing vocals. So I think we just sort of had, there was really no reason to put it on it except that we were just taking all our songs to put on the record and... Um, that was kind of a fun one to do live. Um, then number nine is I Hate Led Zeppelin. That was on the split EP that uh, got burned at the pressing plant. Uh, and I also said on the uh, other uh, 
YouTube video that that song was adopted by Jonathan Brandmeier, who was a radio personality in Chicago, and he used to have it on a uh, little loop thing that whenever someone made a reference to Led Zeppelin, he would play the I Hate Led Zeppelin uh, aspect of it. And um, the original one was, I think, the original one was better than the one that's on the Boogado record. Uh, the original one we had, uh, Russ was in the studio, and I think all our girlfriends, like uh, Vinny's girlfriend, my girlfriend, Ben, you know, this, these girls, Portia and Mickey, who were, they were all good friends together, so there was a whole bunch of us singing the uh, I Hate Led Zeppelin part of that. So, um, but, and, you know, we also had the, uh, we tried to do that, dan, 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 you know, sort of the Led Zeppelin song beginning on it. On it. I think we might have dropped it for the, the this version of it. Um, then My Right is the next song. That becomes, that's sort of an anthem for us, like an early anthem. Um, I'd like to take credit for the guitar work on that, but I'm just the rhythm on that one. Ben actually plays the solo parts on that. And that one to me has a... It, it's interesting that it's 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 like an anthem of ours, but it, it has a style that it wasn't really our style, which was more of the um, straight-edge punks, uh, like Youth of Today and bands like that. It sort of had that feel to the song. And I think that's probably why it did so well in the, the pits, uh, because it had that sort of really driving, thrashing sort of, um, you know, moving into a circle sort of feel to it. Um, then 11 is Nicaragua. Uh, I think at the time we were trying to figure out whether we were a political band or not. We came out of a, the period, time period where a lot of the hardcore bands were very political and the sort of losing their sense of humor and even their sense of melody. And I think one of the things we are known for is sort of bringing that back into the punk scene is that sort of fun element uh, that had gone away for a little while. I mean, the bands were, there were still bands around still doing it, like Circle Jerks and, you know, Adrenaline OD were still around, but um, they were sort of the old school at the time, and uh, most of the bands at that time were doing, like, more political stuff, so. And I, I, I've never been too strongly political. I, I just, I never felt like, I think I even said to Ben, and he, and I think he one day just, like, agreed with me that, uh, you can, I couldn't trust any newspapers. There's so many different points of views, and I, I just didn't feel like we could do justice to politics in the band. Um, so we relied more on being socially aware. So lo socially political is what I call it, where it's more about you know personalities and different types of people. Um, and the next song, twelve, is sunshine, which is a personal one to me uh, because me and Ben met a girl in Muskegon, Michigan, who was very, was young. I mean, we were young at the time, too, but she must have been like, I don't know, 18, 17 or 18, and she had a child. And uh, she was really pretty, but uh, just didn't seem to treat herself really well, and she was very nice, and we got really close to her, and uh, I actually went and stayed with her a little while and toyed with uh, it being a relationship. It never really happened. I was just, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. But we really took to her, but she was also sort of a tragic figure to us. So he wrote that song pretty much dedicated to her. And then that's the one that also has the And Let the Sun Shine In, um, which I'm up until this point, I was pretty sure that, and I'm still pretty sure that the that comes from uh, the Flintstones, uh, which is another TV reference, the, the, the kids... Uh, sang that and they became I remember in the episode they sang that and then they became really famous and they sang in front of a huge audience and that was the and let the sunshine in um, but I also read recently that that song is also in a John Waters movie who Ben was also a fan of John Waters but I'm pretty sure it might have came from the the Flintstones uh, the number 13 is I want to be naked um, that was by far uh, our our biggest uh, hit at the time, uh, and it was uh, stupid fun. And that was also the second version of recording of that one, too. Um, one thing that was great about it is that people, when we played that song, people eventually would start getting naked, and there were these group of Polish punks, too, that would uh, one time at a show at uh, McGregor's, they actually bought uh, different stuffed animals that... Uh, to cover their penises. I think they were like underwear that had like, you know, like an elephant's nose. Uh, and they all got naked in the pit with these things on it. It was su stupid hilarious. Um, but there would be like hundreds of people that would just get naked. But the funny thing was, 
is that uh, as soon as the song would end, everyone would just like zoom and look for their clothes, like their inhibitions had sort of all, you know, had come back, and they, and they, they were also all of, a, all of a sudden ashamed of their nakedity. Um, and that also has the uh, direct reference to the "I want to be sedated" in it, where we where we break into the the "I want to be sedated" part and shows that we still have a lot to learn in how to downstroke through. A Ramon song because I think it's it sounds kind of lame but it's a funny idea uh, and on the original version that's uh, next would be this thing called Bogota which was a, a collage that I had put together of all these different uh, concerts uh, concert uh, sound bites uh, most of them were at the Peace Fest that we did in uh, Chicago uh, we wanted there to be 27 songs on the record so that was why we stuck that one on there on the original um, I I actually miss it on the the the, the later version of it. I don't, I think Ben just didn't, didn't didn't care for that. But I really liked I really liked playing with sound bites on records. Uh, so the second side uh, starting track is Ashtray, oh, which is a great song, one of my favorites from that record. Um, and that was about when we went to when we drove all the way to uh, Berkeley, California. Uh, some of us stayed at the Ashtray, which was a House by that uh, was rented by uh, Lenny, Jake, and Jesse. Uh, Lenny was in a band, Isocracy, and and Jesse was in uh, Operation Ivy. Uh, I, uh, yeah, he was in Operation Ivy at the time, um, and that place was sort of a, a den of iniquity, where all the all the sort of super intelligent but yet uh, crusty punks would all like sort of camp out at that place uh, and act really weird and strange and I think for us uh, suburban Midwest kids it was kind of a weird experience they were just really out there uh, to us you know because they're you know that that's also where all the hippies were too so the intellectuals and the hippies and these punks were just like nothing we had ever experienced before um, so that song was based on that play and they called their their place the ashtray um, Number 16 is American Suicide. Don't remember much about that one, except that also was from the EP. Um, no, it was, it's a really fast song, uh, and uh, it, I feel like uh, I started getting a little bit better at playing the quicker stuff, so I think I did a pretty good job on uh, doing the rhythm on that one. Uh, number 17 is Psychiatrist, uh, which was kind of a play on a, a ramones -y sort of... Uh, a feel too of, of of songs about you know uh, about the the brain and um, going insane um, and that uh, that solo in it which isn't really a solo it's a, it's a sort of a melodic part is me uh, playing that one I kind of like the sound of it it isn't too uh, flowy but uh, it has a really tense sounding to it it's almost like the kind of like the the Batman theme song um, but that goes throughout the whole song. Uh, and at the end of that, we we changed for the second when we remixed it. We added all the uh, the uh, psych, you know, all the uh, psych patient sounds to the end of it, which was like, which is a lot like we are we're a happy family. That's what it's like from the Ramones. Um, and then number eighteen is Man of the Paper Boy, uh, where there's a recording of us with Phil Bonet, our engineer, at the front of that. And I think it's really funny. I think we originally just were going to have him do the uh, the yelling at us, yelling uh, at us, uh, but then we, but then he was reading it so poorly that we decided to make us telling him to read it as part of the, to part of the bit, so it's kind of a meta bit, and uh, I think it's pretty funny, and there's a moment where Ben sort of starts laughing, and what I was doing was, and I was doing it too much on purpose, but I was uh, crinkling the papers so we can have the sound of papers, like Phil is holding the paper, um, but then I was doing it too much, and Ben just started laughing. Um, and that's a pretty funny song, and that actually would be the cover for the the uh, UK release on Wet Spots Records. Uh, they would have a really cool full color uh, cover on that on the Boogada Boogada Boogada, and that has a picture of a uh, of a you know paper boy on a bicycle. Um, and then I love to hate. This is really kind of like a. Uh, Ben's take on a angry Samoan song. It really has a really strong, uh, like the song, um, uh, 
lights out. Uh, yeah, it's a really great song, and, and it's it's it, it's a theme that Ben sort of continues on with about this idea of love and hate, and to love to hate. Uh, he's really big into the, the hating, <laughs> you know, uh, like what we hate, love to hate. Um, and then the next song is More Problems, which was written by Warren. Um, I don't have much to say about that one. No. Uh, 21 is Supermarket Fantasy, uh, another great song on this record. I talked this a little bit about this on my Periscope where I showed how to play it. Um, ben created the most of the solo, um, but it was a faster one, so I, 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 I played it, and it's actually one of my favorite to play. And it's it's actually fairly difficult for uh, for a, a beginner to play, so I was... Um, I actually think I did a pretty good job on that on the record, and that's also doubled. Uh, the second half of it, uh, I created the sort of slower melodic part, and Ben created the more interesting be beginning of it. Um, that one we used to always play a lot too. That was a, a favorite at the shows. Um, Holy Hardcore was my sort of still playing with the uh, me trying to play as good as someone like from Iron Maiden or or UFO. Um, I think that solo is actually pretty good at the end. It's it's all just a bunch of Randy Rhodes from Ozzy, Ozzy's band sort of stuff thrown together. Uh, and that band is about, uh, you know, religious religion in, in hardcore. And uh, there was a little bit of that going on at the time. Um, the next one is 23, Professional Distribution. Um, I, at the time, was... I had this Dr. Rhythm drum machine and... Uh, I would create stuff on there. I would just play bass to a drum track, and then if it was kind of a cool bass part, I would throw uh, guitars and whatever on top of it, uh, just through cassette players. I would take two cassette players and record on one, and then have that one record as a play as the other one was recording. It was like really rudimentary uh, home recording before there was the digital. Um, and I pretty much came up with that whole song from beginning to end, all the music, even the part in the middle with the, where, uh, with the bass where the, everything else drops out was exactly like my uh, Dr. Rhythm recording of it. And then uh, Ben uh, wrote the lyrics based on an experience we had with uh, these guys, uh, producers uh, from a label called Walk Through Fire, um, who invited us to a meeting to uh, try to... Uh, re-release our first record I think and they, I don't remember there was it was such a horrible meeting I remember me and Ben were sitting at the at the guys on the guys chairs and the guy comes in he looked like uh, I can't remember his name but on the Three's Company the the best friend of of Jack Tripper he, he looked exactly like him and he was wearing sunglasses and he came in and he had our record he goes uh, guys you guys you, you, you got the buzz but this record cover has got to go uh, and uh, we just, uh, we didn't really like them at all, and we sort of just laughed, and uh, we never signed to them. And a couple other bands that we knew signed to them and got kind of screwed. Um, so it was a good thing that we never signed to them. But that song is about that, because uh, they had said to us that uh, we can get you professional distribution. Um, the next song is 24, Used Cars. Uh, I think I was with Ben when he went to go get his Chevy Malibu? That might be it. I mean, I know that we had experience going to a bunch of different used car places. I don't know whether it was get a van originally or to get his uh, Malibu. Because he eventually I think he got the Malibu from an old woman that never drove it. But we tried to find a vehicle uh, and we almost, yeah, we almost bought a bus. Um, but we had some horrible experiences with that. And so the song was kind of based on that. And also... Uh, ben and I were also big fans of the movie Used Cars that by with Kurt Russell, uh, so that was also a sort of influence on the title. Uh, Twenty five is Hunter, which is uh, a song about uh, killing animals, um, against the idea of killing animals, and that was uh, one of Warren's songs from beginning to end. Uh, I think yeah, Ben sings it. That's right. See, that was also on the, the split EP, but Warren was singing it, so. Ben sang it on the on the book of the record. And then number 26 is uh, I Believe in UFOs. This was the most time we spent on a song. 
uh, piecing all, all of it together. Uh, it was a lot of fun. We were using a bunch of different effects on it, uh, which uh, we didn't use much on the records, but uh, uh, Phil sort of introduced us to all these different sounds. And uh, I think me and Ben are both playing uh, different kinds of leads and and that. Uh, it was just really... We turned a song that was kind of mediocre into, a, I think, a really, really fun song. Um, then the last song on the record, number 27, was Hey Suburbia, lyrics by Weasel, music by Jughead and Weasel. Um, of course, one of our classics about, you know, about living in the suburbs. Um, the story of this one, why it has me and Ben for music is not contentious because he, he agreed to it immediately, but he does not remember um, this, this, this story that I, I'm going to tell. And, uh, but he agreed, to, uh, he agreed to it, Ben. Um, and now, you know, over, over years, I question it, but I'm pretty sure what, what happened was we, you know, we used to uh, work on songs in his, uh, in his bedroom uh, sometimes when his mother was out in the living room. Um, and I showed him one part of a song that I didn't have anything for. I think it was, you know, it was pretty much the, the verse for um, Hey Suburbia. And then nothing came of it. And then a couple days later, he brought in the song, Hey Suburbia. And I was like, hey, that's that part that I showed you. And, yeah. and that, that happens, you know. I mean, I, we do it all the time. And I do it in the theater. And we're always constantly catching ourselves, uh, forgetting that someone showed us something. And then, you know, you create something out of it. So he did not remember that happening. Um, but he was good enough to go, okay, yeah, it must have happened if you, if you said it happened. So... Uh, I was given half credit on the on the music for that song, that great song, and I also play the solo. It's one of my favorite solos to play. I can. That's one. Of the, I I can't retain a lot of space in my head for songs over years, but that solo always immediately comes back to me. I I just I think it is the best uh, constructed solo of like our early early careers. Um, it's such a, I, I love it. It's simple, and it's, uh, you know, it's the same part that plays over uh, the changing of chords, which is, which is great, which we started by playing just one note at a time over chords and go, oh, wow, that one note hangs over all these chords, and then we discovered we could play a few different notes over chords, like basic, basic music theory stuff that was all very new to us since we were self-taught. Um... Yeah, and that that song we played from uh, from it, when it was created all the way up until wow, I mean, until we stopped playing like in around 96, 97. Um and then in the later years of reforming, I don't think we hardly ever played it. Uh, but I I used to play with a bunch of other bands like the Mangies and the Lillingtons and and with my band even in Blackouts. Uh so that's it. That's the full record. Uh, and now it sounds like there's like an insane, crazy storm going on outside. So I'm going to take a look out there and uh, hopefully I will decide to release this. Thanks for listening to uh, my second uh, album in the chronology of my recordings. Uh, Boogada Boogada Boogada, released in 1988. Uh, Screeching Weasel record. Um, also, oh, you know what I'll say about this one is that it's uh, we have been and I get the most royalties out of any record from this one. Not only because it sold uh, the most, but um, we did most of the writing, so it's almost split to 50-50. Uh, Steve gets a little bit, um, and Warren uh, didn't want it. He didn't want any royalties from it, so uh, Ben and I were able to split those. So it's for the longest time, when that record was re-released on Lookout Records, I was pretty much living off... Uh, that record alone. Um, now these days, uh, you know, I, we hardly see anything from it. But, um, but at the time, that was a pretty big deal for me and Ben. We were able to commit uh, to the band without having to work other jobs, uh, predominantly because of that record. All right, that's it. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>